Hello, friends. Uh, we continue to be closed uh, at the lodge uh, because of the pandemic of uh, coronavirus. And we're coming to you from our home, uh, and we're going to be talking today about psychic and noetic action. We're going to start the process. Probably won't be able to finish, but we'll finish uh, finish later on in the next round, maybe next week. Uh, the United Lodge of Theosophist policy is independent devotion to the cause of theosophy without professing attachment to any theosophical organization. It is loyal to the great founders of the theosophical movement, but does not concern itself with dissensions or differences of individual opinion. The work it has on hand and the end it keeps in view are too absorbing and too lofty to leave it the time or inclination to take part in side issues. That work and that end is the dissemination of the fundamental principles of the philosophy of theosophy and the exemplification and practice of those principles through a truer realization of the self, a profounder conviction of universal brotherhood. It holds that the unassailable basis for union among theosophists, wherever and however situated, is similarity of aim, purpose, and teaching, and therefore has neither constitution bylaws, nor officers, the sole bond between its associates being that basis. And it aims to disseminate this idea among theosophists in the furtherance of unity. It regards as theosophists all who are engaged in the true service of humanity without distinction of race, creed, sex, condition, or organization, and it welcomes to its association all those who are in accord with its declared purposes and who desire to fit themselves by study and otherwise to be the better able to help and teach others. The true theosophist belongs to no cult or sect, yet belongs to each and all. If we choose to do so, our uh, so associates may sign a form stating, being in sympathy with the purposes of this lodge as set forth in its declaration, I hereby record my desire to be enrolled as an associate, it being understood that such association calls for no obligation on my part other than that which I myself determine. And now we're going to have a reading from a devotional book followed by our discussion of psychic and noetic action. Today's reading comes from the Bhagavad Gita. Fearlessness, sincerity, assiduity in devotion, generosity, self-restraint, piety and almsgivings, study, mortification and rectitude, harmlessness, veracity and freedom from anger, resignation, equanimity and not speaking of the faults of others, universal compassion, modesty and mildness, patience, power, fortitude and purity, discretion, dignity, unrevengefulness and freedom from conceit. These are the marks of him whose virtues are of a godlike character of son of Bharata. Those of son of Pritha who are born with demonical dispositions are marked with hypocrisy, pride, anger, presumption, harshness of speech and ignorance. The destiny of those 
whose attributes are godlike is final liberation, while those of demonical disposition, born to the Asra's lot, suffer continued bondage to mortal birth. Grieve not, O son of Pandu, for thou art born with the divine destiny. There are two kinds of natures in beings in this world, that which is godlike and the other which is demonical. The godlike hath been fully declared. And um, now today's talk. Psychic and noetic action is one of those seminal uh, articles that HPV wrote in two parts um, for Lucifer at that time. But the um, subject matter is of great interest to us even today. Uh, unless one understands the workings of the mind, the uh, theosophical philosophy cannot be understood. And this student went into um, research to find out if the same issues today exist as it was then in the 19th century. And unfortunately for us, they do because um, science is still discussing the same issues, even though HPV had given a tremendous explanation and um, sorted it out at that time as to how we should look at these issues. Obviously, uh, the general public does not read this book, but um, in the future uh, centuries, uh, it is hoped that it will become a textbook so that all those students um, in the school system can actually read and understand the secret doctrine. Um, she started the uh, article with a quotation from Milton, uh, which is, has some significance, so we'll read it. I made men just and right, sufficient to have stood, though free to fall, such I created all the ethereal powers and spirits, both them who stood and them who failed. Truly, they stood who stood and fell who fell. Milton. This uh, is still applicable today because we do have free choice, which is a subject of this first section. Um, when she was writing this article, some of the students of theosophy were appealing uh, to HPV that uh, the articles presented to the world's uh, consideration at that time uh, be made to coincide with what um, science uh, or scientific discoveries were saying. And HPV said that um, the motto of the Theosophical Movement is there is no higher religion than truth. And uh, she refused to give in to that demand uh, by the students that the uh, articles written uh, should coincide with uh, scientific uh, work. And she explained the reasons for it as to why. Uh, she says that the um, science uh, of that day, and this is still today, um, carries on with examining the nature of our physical world. And it is done by uh, all scientists around the world uh, who believe in the uh, methodology that uh, came down to us from Aristotle. Uh, so if we cannot see it, if we cannot touch it, if we cannot repeat the experiment, then it is not true. Whereas the philosophy of the, the ancients uh, that came uh, into um, discussions of the uh, issues at that time were based on law. The um, scientific world came up with uh, hypothetical uh, questions uh, based on hypotheses and then they came, they tried to come up with an answer to it. And the uh, presentation of the uh, law uh, which is in the 
books that were uh, presented uh, at that time uh, by HPV, Mr. Judge, and others in the Theosophical Movement uh, deal with uh, laws. These are general laws, uh, and karma and reincarnation is the fundamental uh, accepted view of the all of the uh, ancient philosophers and the uh, discussions uh, are based on reality. Reality is what is referred to in those books um, coming close to homogeneity, whereas on the physical plane, everything is based on heterogeneity as well as um, myavic uh, existences. What needs to be done is to go behind the uh, physical examination and look at the other aspects of the constitution of our world as well as the human being himself. So um, it is stated that this uh, request of the some of the students at that time was quite close to what the medieval cosiest were doing because they were uh, distorting the truth and sometimes even suppressing it so that it did not clash with divine revelation. But she says uh, this compromise is not going to take place with this work uh, of um, presenting to the world uh, some of the um, occult philosophies uh, which had not seen the daylight up to that time. And of course, once they are presented, they're not esoteric anymore. Um, she says that some uh, errors perhaps uh, will creep into the presentations, um, but those uh, are normally made by the presenters, not uh, the um, doctrine itself, and that whatever is the error can be corrected by reference uh, to the Guttavitya from which it is taken. Whereas the um, shifting sense of modern scientific guesswork, especially uh, in relation to psychology and mental phenomena, uh, we are told is not realistic. Well, it wasn't realistic then, and it is not uh, realistic today either. So, um, the other point made uh, in this paper is that if um, uh, exact sciences limited their uh, activity to the realm of nature on the physical plane alone, uh, to its legitimate boundaries, um, uh, such as surgery, chemistry, uh, biology, etc. She says that uh, that would be okay. Uh, the modern science uh, would be assisted. However, since they um, overstep their boundaries and go into uh, functions and phenomena of the mind, uh, stating that a careful analysis brings them the conviction that there is no free agent in uh, animal or man, uh, then uh, it is correct, she says, for the occultists uh, to protest against these statements. Because after all, uh, according to the um, scientific world, their uh, presentations are prejudiced and one-sided at best. So they can not claim any authority uh, on mental physiology and when they talk about the physiology of the soul. No such noun, it is stated, can be applied to the soul unless by soul the psychic mind, the lower mind, is meant, which develops in man proportionally with the perfection of his brain uh, uh, into intellect and in the animal into a higher instinct. <coughs> so 
So uh, in printing this article in Lucifer, uh, she's pointing out that it is the duty of um, Lucifer to um, bring forth the uh, discrepancies between science and uh, the theosophical truths. And when she's talking about science, she means majority of the scientific men of the time, uh, whereas uh, a minority was with her own thinking and presentation. The study of physiology of the soul, of the will in men, and of his higher consciousness from the standpoint of genius and its manifesting faculties can never be summarized into a system of, of general ideas represented by a brief formula. No more than the psychology uh, of material nature can have its manifold mysteries solved by the mere analysis of its physical phenomena. The activities of self-consciousness, um, when discussed uh, by the physical uh, uh, basis, uh, she says that no answer can be given or suggested to such a uh, implication. Uh, from its very nature, the uh, mind uh, is a unit uh, and uh, it recognizes the states as its own and have no analogous or corresponding material substratum for its working. So it is impossible to specify any physiological process representing this unifying actors. It is even impossible to imagine how the description of any such process could be brought into intelligible relation with this unique mental power. Uh, this is uh, quoted from Ladd, professor of philosophy in Yale University at that time, uh, whose thinking uh, was in the right direction. Thus the whole conclave of psychophysiologists may be challenged to correctly define consciousness. And it is stated that they're sure to fail because self-consciousness belongs alone to man and proceeds from the self, uh, capital S-E-L-F, meaning the higher manas. Whereas the psychic element, which is uh, in the literature referred to as kama manas, is common to both the animal and the human being. The far higher degree of its development in the latter resting merely on the greater perfection and sensitiveness of the cerebral cells. So no physiologist, not even the cleverest, will ever be able to solve the mystery of the human mind and its highest spiritual manifestation or in its dual aspect of psychic and noetic or monastic uh, or even to comprehend the intricacies of the former on a purely material plane. So, um, in the olden uh, archaic literature, uh, noetic is referred to, but in the writings, uh, we refer to it as monastic, because noetic comes from uh, nous, uh, the Greek word, uh, whereas monastic uh, relates itself to mahat, which is the root word, uh, which is Sanskrit. So uh, when we are considering the mind and its workings, uh, as we have already stated, uh, it is referred to as the lower manas and the other is the higher manas. The um, uh, lower manas being the psychic element in us and the higher meaning the uh, spiritual uh, aspect of it. Now, when we discuss it, we are referring to the personal when it refers to kama manas and the impersonal when it is uh, referred to the higher mind. Um, So when we are talking about the psychic and monastic or noetic, uh, we are told that 
between the personality and the individuality, which is the permanent aspect of that human being, there exists uh, the, a tremendous abyss, uh, just like there is an abyss between Jack the Ripper and the Holy Buddha. So unless the physiologist accepts the workings of the mind in its two aspects, uh, it is stated that they will run into a quagmire. And um, it is quoted uh, uh, from Herzen, uh, who was a Lausanne professor of physiology at that time, uh, who did not believe in spontaneity or free will in men. And this is what he says. In the boundless physical and chemical laboratory that surrounds men, organic life represents quite an unimportant group of phenomena and amongst the latter, the place occupied by life, having reached to the stage of consciousness, is so minute that it is absurd to exclude men from the sphere of action of a general law in order to allow in him the existence of a subjective spontaneity or a free will standing outside of that law. But since the occultist or students of theosophy, understand the difference between the psychic and noetic or monastic elements in men. This is pure trash, is the statement, notwithstanding its sound scientific basis. Because when the author puts the question, if psychic phenomena do not represent the results of an action of a molecular character, whither then does motion disappear after reaching the sensory centers? And the answer is that this is never denied. But what does this have to do with free will is the question. That every phenomenon in the visible universe has its genesis is in motion. And this is an old occult axiom. Um, nor uh, do we doubt that the cycle of physiologists would place himself at uh, loggerheads with the whole conclave of exact scientists were he to allow the idea that at a given moment a whole series of physical phenomena may disappear in the vacuum. So this author uh, from whom uh, the um, quotation came uh, does not believe in any spontaneity or self uh, choice in men. But um, the answer to that question is that uh, the set force does not, of course, disappear upon reaching the highest nervous centers, but it is transformed into a different series, uh, such as psychic um, manifestations uh, or uh, to produce some more uh, or a physical character uh, becomes transformed into the latter. So everything then is related to motion. It is motion, but not all molecular motion, as the writer intends us to infer. Motion as the great breath, uh, from the Secret Doctrine, Volume 1, ergo sound, at the same time, is the substratum of cosmic motion. It is beginningless and endless, the one eternal life, the basis and genesis of the subjective and the objective universe for life or beingness is the uh, fonts et ergo of existence of being. Molecular motion is its lowest and most material manifestation, a finite manifestation at that. And if the general law of the conservation of energy leads modern science to the conclusion that psychic activity only represents a special form of motion, the same law guiding the occultists leads them also uh, to a, a similar conclusion, but something further than that. Um, HPV mentions a spiritual action in this um, article. 
which is subject to the same laws and immutable laws of motion at the same time. Uh, both an inorganic, both organic and inorganic worlds, uh, every manifestation in them, conscious or unconscious, represents but the result of a collective cause. To the occultist, this is just ABC of that science. In the uh, old uh, writings, it is a state that all the world is in Swara. Swara is the spirit itself, and it represents the one life or motion, as we just uh, quoted uh, the great breath from the secret doctrine. Uh, the proper translation of the word Swara is the current of life wave, according to the author of Nature's Finer Forces. Um, HBB quotes from his paper. Uh, it is stated that Swara that has given form to the first accumulations of the divisions of the universe, the Swara causes evolution and involution. The Swara is God, or more properly, that great power itself, which is called Maheshwara. The Swara is the manifestation of the impression on matter of that power, which in man is known as the um, mental and psychic consciousness. It is to be understood that the action of this power never ceases. It is unchangeable um, in existence, and this is motion uh, and the universal breath of life of the occultists. Now, uh, this wave emotion, which causes the evolution of cosmic undifferentiated matter into differentiated matter or our universe, where did it come from? This motion, it is stated, is the spirit itself. The word Atma, universal soul, used in the book, itself carries the idea of eternal motion, coming as it does from the root At, A-T, or eternal motion. And it may be significantly remarked that the root At is connected with and in fact is another form of the root a a h breath and as a s being all these roots have their origin in the sound produced by the breath of animals living beings the primeval current of the life wave is then the same which assumes in men the form of inspiratory and expiratory motion of the lungs and this is the all-pervading source of evolution and involution of the universe so motion and the conservation of energy from all books on magic written and taught ages before the birth of inductive and exact modern science what does it say well let us quote from it from the visible atom to the celestial body lost in space, everything is subject to motion. Kept at a definite distance from one, uh, from the other, in proportion to the motion which animates them, the molecules present constant relations which they lose only by the addition or the subtraction of a certain quantity of uh, motion. Occultism says more than this. While making a motion on the material plane <coughs> of conservation of energy to fundamental laws, rather two aspects of the same omnipresent law, Swara, it denies point blank that this have anything to do with free will of man, which belongs to quite a different uh, play. The author of 
Psychophysiology General treating of his discovery that psychic action is but motion and the result of a collective uh, causes remarks that if it is so, then there cannot be any further discussion upon spontaneity in the sense of any native internal proneness created by the human organism and adds that the Ebba puts an end to all claim of free will. The occultist denies the conclusion. The actual fact on man, of man's psychic, uh, we say monastic individuality, uh, is a sufficient warrant against the assumption. For in the case of this conclusion being correct or being indeed, as the author expresses it, the collective hallucination of the whole mankind through the ages, there would be an end also to psychic individuality. Um, psychic individuality um, means uh, that self-determining power which enables man to override circumstances. Um, if we place half a dozen animals in the same, of the same species under the same con uh, circumstances, their actions would be very uh, similar or almost identical to one another. But if we place half a dozen men under the same circumstances, their actions will be as different as their characters are. Uh, in other words, their psychic individuality. But if we call this psychic, uh, in quotation mark, the higher self-conscious will in men, then having shown by uh, science of psychophysiology itself that will has no special organ, then the materialists uh, connected with molecular motion. How so? Uh, Professor Ladd uh, states, the phenomena of human consciousness must be regarded as, as activities of some other form of real being than the moving molecules of the brain. They require a subject or ground which is in its nature unlike the phosphorized fats of the central masses. The aggregate aggregated nerve fibers of the nerve cells of the cerebral cortex. This real being thus manifested immediately to itself in the phenomena of consciousness and directly to others through the bodily changes is the mind, manas. To it, the mental phenomena are to be attributed as showing what it is by what it does. Uh, the so-called mental faculties are only the modes of the behavior in consciousness of this real being. We actually find by the only available method that this real being called mind believes in certain perpetually recurring modes. Therefore, we attribute to it certain faculties. Mental faculties are not entities that have an existence of themselves. They are the modes of the behavior in consciousness of the mind and the very nature of the classifying acts which lead to their being distinguished is explicable only upon the assumption that a real being called mind exists and is to be distinguished from the real beings known as the physical molecules of the brain's nervous mass. The higher manas or ego, Shetrajna, is the silent spectator and the voluntary sacrificial victim. The lower manas, its representative, a tyrannical despot truly. And having shown that we have to regard consciousness as a unit, um, the um, author adds, we conclude then from the previous considerations, the subject of all the states of consciousness is a real unit being called mind, which is of non-material nature and acts and develops according to laws of its own, but is especially correlated with certain material molecules and masses forming the substance of the brain. Uh, this is uh, quoted uh, from the elements of 
physiological psychology. And I think we're going to stop it here. And uh, next week we'll continue uh, from this point because it is very detailed. Uh, its understanding requires uh, listening to it more than once or reading it uh, several times. And uh, we'll let um, the absorption of it take place uh, until we continue with it again next week. If you have any questions, please submit them and we'll try to answer them. Thank you.